Welcome to yet another session of Domains 21. And uh, I'm your host today, Jim Groom. And I have the absolute pleasure of introducing three folks who will be working, who have been working with WordPress multi-site um, for a while now. And I was interested in putting together a panel to talk a little bit about not only how they're using WordPress multi-site on campus, but what that usage has looked like during the pandemic. So I'm gonna hand this over first to Lori Miles to talk a little bit about her work and then folks will chime in and hopefully we'll have a great discussion. So thanks for coming to this session. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Laurie Miles. Um, I'm an instructional technology specialist with the Center for Teaching and Learning at UNC Asheville. Um, I am not a web designer. I'm not a web developer. I am an instructional technologist and designer. So um, I definitely cannot talk the, the web design, web development talk, but I want to tell you our experience with WordPress and how successful it has been. Um, um, UNC Asheville is a small liberal arts college in the UNC system. The UNC system has about 17 universities that are connected. Um, we're small liberal arts. We have about 3,700 students and um, about 250 full-time faculty. Uh, we first got a WordPress multi-site back in 2016 when we ran a digital humanities pilot pro study, um, mostly to introduce faculty and their students to digital humanities tools such as interactive timelines, interactive mapping, um, digital storytelling, data visualization tools, infographics. Um, it gave students a different way to um, uh, basically show their learning other than just writing a term paper. Because of the pilot study, uh, we found that the WordPress, uh, the WordPress gave the students a place to actually um, a platform to show their work, to show their digital projects. Um, the pilot study was really well received and everybody really liked WordPress. So we ended up keeping WordPress um, for these digital projects um, to continue to use in classes. Um, but it also gave students a place to record and reflect on what they were learning and share that information with a larger internet audience. So they learned how to not just develop but also how to write for an internet audience. Since then, we still use our WordPress multi-site as a, a venue for these digital projects, student digital projects, but it's also evolved into this great platform for applied learning situations for the students like internships and um, study abroad uh, experiences and service learning projects, undergraduate research, as well as um, portfolios. Um, our English department has adopted WordPress as their writing portfolio platform for their students, um, as well as blogging. And then some students request our sites for their organizations. And our sites are available to our faculty, staff, and students. So we also have faculty who have been requesting sites, mostly for personal websites um, to display their research or uh, you know, talk about their courses that they teach and that sort of thing. Um, some have been using it for posting and showcasing student work or the, for their department, or um, some have used our WordPress sites for an, a campus event or a conference. And then some have used our WordPress sites for maybe a grant that they've been awarded. So uh, explain that grant. It's grown quite a bit from that small pilot study back in uh, 2016, which involved about seven or eight faculty, approximately 35 of their students. And I think we set up 10 original sites with that pilot study. We now have over 1400 sites in our WordPress multi-site and that includes about over 1300 students or users actually and that includes in those users about 70 to 75 faculty and staff who've used our used our WordPress site so it's grown quite a bit that's excellent I mean wow let me let's just even the playing field here Lori there we go um, yeah that's that's fascinating that you grew from just a pilot to 1400 
And I'd be interested, Colin, what's your experience been like? I know you introduced WordPress multi-site at Trinity Western University. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. A lot of parallels to you. uh, UNC Asheville as well. Uh, we're small private liberal arts university in lower mainland of BC, uh, just outside of Vancouver. I started there as manager of instructional technology and online learning in 2016 and installing WordPress was one of the first things I did. Um, it was a WordPress multi-site on shared hosting with Reclaim and you know, we started the the first big project was getting our education students building their uh, portfolios, uh, their professional year portfolios in WordPress rather than the current heavily templated site that they were using prior to that. Um, since then, uh, we've grown to we're just a little under three thousand sites and users. We've got a few more users. There are, yeah, a few more users than sites. Uh, so a few people have signed up but haven't created a site. Um, mostly what we're using it for is portfolios at this point. Um, we started a foundations project, which it, uh, foundations is a course that all first year students take in their first semester. And it's kind of an introduction to liberal arts learning. Uh, and so every incoming first year student gets a site. And so we're adding about five or 600 sites each year. So that's caused us to grow. We stretched beyond the shared hosting and went to a, uh, a dedicated server. And now we're on Reclaim Cloud. One of the questions is you have a kind of custom template, almost like a, like a, a cloner situation where you've created a custom portfolio possibility for your users. Like, how is that working? I'm interested in that and, you know, what work you did. Um, Yeah, we worked with Alan Levine uh, 2017 or 18, and he created uh, some custom themes for us that, you know, he created four, four themes and he built in kind of the structure of the foundations course. And so students can come in they choose one of those four themes and we've actually added a bunch more for, for different uses now. And when they choose one of those themes, they get a clone of that site. So it comes built in with menus and some custom post types and categories and all everything is ready to go along with some instructions on how to get going. Uh, so instead of getting, you know, a, a blank WordPress site with, hello world, uh, they, they get a site that's built out with some templates already and some instructions like, hey, if you want to change the content on this page, click here, click the edit button. And really like training wheels to kind of get them up and running with, hey, this is it. This is how you use WordPress. Here's one really well put together portfolio site, but feel free to explore beyond that. Yeah, I really like that. The splat idea in some ways or smallest possible learning online tool that Brian Lamb and Alan Levine created as a as a kind of structure within which to make using WordPress even that much easier. Yeah, yeah, it's worked really well. Great. Well, thank you. Shannon, how are you? How's it going? Good. Welcome to Domains 21. Can you talk a little bit about WordPress at University of Mary Washington? I can. Uh, you know, how much time do you have? Uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm the uh, associate director of the Digital Knowledge Center at Mary Washington, which is not a title that discusses at all any of the work I do. Uh, and I've been in that position since November, no, October of 2019. And but I've been at Mary Washington working since 2013. And I was also a student from 2006 to 2010. And so uh, I feel like I've seen a lot of the evolution. I'm going to be talking about UMW blogs because that is our WordPress multi-site. Um, and that started in 2007. Uh, and, you know, I feel like, Jim, at any point you want to just pop in. It feels weird to talk about some of these projects as I'm going to touch on domains a little bit. And Jim, uh, along with other members of DTLT, were people who started UMW blogs um, at Mary Washington, as well as uh, Domain of One's Own. So uh, it started 
just, you know, it's weird to hear these experiments still happening because to me, multi-site is this thing, this archaic piece of software that people were doing way back when. Um, in fact, in some ways, we'll probably talk about this uh, when we talk about the pandemic. Mary Washington made the move to really strongly push domain of one's own. And our, our, um, because of that, of the consequences that our WordPress multi-site kind of started to languish and not really get the attention and love it's needed. And um, over the past year or so, working with Reclaim Hosting and the people within my unit, we're, we're trying to think about how we could revitalize that space uh, in contrast to Domain of One's Own, uh, because, you know, as I've been hearing uh, other people talk about, it provides that really easy way to get into WordPress, get to publishing right away, where Domain of One's Own has a little more of a learning curve. Um, as well, so that that's the the bit a uh, bit of history. So since 2007, UMW Blogs has existed, and it comes with all the legacy cruft you imagine uh, a a uh, system that is that old entails. So dismantling that and getting people excited about that space again, just added some new themes and plugins in the hopes that people will be like, oh, this is not a dated website anymore. Um, to get people thinking about that space and what it could afford over say a domain of one's own or how one might why one might one might use one over over the other and uh in at Merritt Washington. So, you know, long legacy of being in those spaces and thinking about how to use that kind of technology. That's a great overview, Shannon. Thank you. And it actually really transitions beautifully into a discussion we can all have now um, about what has the usage of WordPress and WordPress multi-site in this situation looked like over the last year? I mean, there's been a lot of discussions about, you know, shifts, right, to the, the year of Zoom, right, uh, the LMS. And I would be interested just each of you working as you do with um, WordPress multi-site on your campus. What does that situation look like with supporting uh, that kind of work in particular? Shannon, you talked about like this moving to a simpler self-service up and running. You don't have to deal with cPanel and domain of one's own and some of that overhead, right? You can put people in really seamlessly. And then when you have tools like you talked about, Colin, with the cloner, you really open up possibilities for a quick portfolio website that you can explore beyond, but you could really solve a lot without the same overhead as something like Domain of One's Own. So I'd love to hear you all talk a little bit about your experience. Maybe, Lori, you can start us off and yeah. then folks yeah. jump in. I'd be glad to. Um, I, we've definitely seen an uptick um, since the pandemic, and particularly with the faculty requesting our sites, because I think the faculty are just, now they've had to jump to online, they're looking for all sorts of different tools to make that, happen for them and to make sure they get the information and their resources and materials content to the students. So we have definitely seen an uptick in uh, faculty requests. Uh, for example, this spring, uh, I was counting up, we have 17 new faculty have requested sites. And that's up from, I think there were six last spring in 2020 and like seven in fall 20. 2020. So it's definitely more. And what we're seeing is that there is um, what they're using them for is mostly uh, to, to make online resources for their course, like say a syllabus or course materials um, that can be seen easily in um, like responsive in, in like a, a tablet or a, a cell phone. Um, and so the student wouldn't have to go to a PDF, which is a little bit more difficult to read on say a cell phone. Um, another way we've seen an increase is that faculty want a site that they can um, put their course materials out there and share that in information or those resources with their colleagues, either in their department or at another school. So those are the two big areas I've seen a change over, and particularly this semester. Like the, the old school idea that a WordPress site is an open educational resource where you could put links, videos, create a whole, I mean, I've seen some amazing examples of WordPress sites that really are elaborate teaching resources, you know, that are open and accessible beyond that. But yeah, Colin, Shannon. Okay, yeah, uh, I wish that I could say that we had like an upswing and people excited about getting into UMW blogs or even Domain of One's Own, but 
what we experienced was kind of the opposite uh, in many ways. And I'm, I'm going to chalk that up to the fact that we are a really small unit um, on campus and we did not lead in that, that conversation. Um, and so, you know, so many people were desperate to think about online uh, and you know, there was some, not a lot of pressure from the top, but there was an expectation that you would use Canvas, which is our LMS, in some baseline way. So, you know, the provost says, it should be a landing page and faculty here, you must use Canvas or else, right? You know, so there's this disconnect. And then if you were gonna add, you know, something like UMW blogs on top of that, it becomes yet another technology thing that they would have to worry about. So one of the big things I've been thinking about since we've kind of seen our numbers drop in some ways, people, not utilizing it in the same way is that I want to help faculty uh, think about what are the connections they can make between the LMS and you know UMW blogs or domain one zone. Like how can you use these? They're, it's not either or. Like it's not like you're either in Canvas or you're in you know UMW blogs. How how can you utilize what you know what one does well? What you know the other? I would not recreate a grade book in UMW blogs. That seems like crazy to me. <laughs> Canvas does that. Like let's like let that live there. Um, but like, what could you do in a WordPress multi-site that you just Canvas locks you down, doesn't let you do? Uh, that, that's awesome. We, what I noticed, you know, coming into this last year is, you know, there, there's not a long history of online learning at Trinity Western. We're very much a, a residential, face-to-face -face environment, and so it, there, there, there's just not a long culture of thinking about teaching online. Um, but I had a, a couple of faculty in, um, in the fine arts department who wanted something a little bit beyond Moodle. And so they started playing around with WordPress and this was just before, you know, everything shut down. Um, and one of those guys, Josh Hale teaches a class a fine arts class and, uh, he, has some experience in WordPress. And so he put together a really nice site, um, you know, and built it from the ground up and had everything ready to go. And then he shared it in, in his department. And so we've got three, four, five other faculty who are brand new to WordPress who have this awesome template that they're starting with. And what I noticed is the faculty that put together those sites last summer, really had a, they had great courses this fall. Wow. Still a lot of work and it was still exhausting, but they, because they had put so much thought into building that site and building the structure of their course, they they had a much easier time uh, this, this last fall when, you know, a lot of other people who hadn't had that opportunity um, maybe had a bit more work to do. One of the things I agree, I mean, that's interesting, the idea of putting the time into building the infrastructure and the course and then watching it. And one of the things I know we played a lot with with UMW blogs and Laura Gibbs has talked about recently when talking about beyond the LMS is the idea of students having their own space to do that work, to do that reflection, to do that writing and, uh, you know, blogging. Can we say that word? Do that blogging and then have it kind of stream in or syndicate into a more centralized space, right? What has been termed the mother blog. And like it almost seems, as Shannon, you were joking about earlier, it almost seems archaic to be talking about like RSS, syndication, people having their own site, my website, and then that streaming into a course site. But I still think like it was one of the real kind of asynchronous, decentralized methods of using some of these technology tools that was a lost opportunity over the last year. And I don't think it was for lack, I mean, for complexity. I don't necessarily think, I think there was this sense where presence is all, right? Like being there, if you can't be there, is everything. And there was no other way to be there than for us like this to be split into the Hollywood squares of another presentation. And I just wonder why that was and why the actual tools that made the web so amazing were so quickly, you know, um, disregarded. I mean, I know this is an open ended question, so jump in. But I was just wondering in your experience, like, what's your take on that? I, I think there's a lot of 
kind of reversion to what's comfortable that you know happened in the last year um you know the the initial transition the pivot as we've come to say you know to this emergency remote teaching uh was really traumatic for a lot of faculty um and so they they went to what they know and you know i i wasn't gonna fault anybody for trying to try just trying to survive that last three weeks of spring uh what was 20, 2020 uh, so i think that played a lot into it and um since then i think we've been able to build capacity and i think there's more pliability and kind of willingness to look at some new new ways of thinking about online learning i'm gonna yeah. play i'm gonna play the devil's advocate here for just one second with something you said colin is but did they know zoom or did they have to learn zoom in the pivot like, so that to me is like, they could have learned several things, but the thing we all decided for them to learn seemingly was Zoom or some Zoom-like product. Yeah, I, they, they certainly had to learn Zoom, but learning Zoom wasn't, it, it, behind Zoom was still the lecture, mm -hmm. which, which yeah. is still a comfortable place, yeah. I think. I, you know, the I, I had multiple conversations about, you know, hey, you, you don't have to lecture. You can take your lecture notes and type those out. And then, you know, stu students who don't have, um, you know, significant bandwidth, those students can still participate. And and there was a, I got a hard no on that one. You know, well, no, I, I couldn't possibly do that. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's that reversion to what's comfortable. I. I think that played a lot. Well, one thing I, I've noticed is that there are, I agree with Colin, and we're a small university too that did not adopt online at all. We had Moodle as our LMS, and that was usually used as a supplement to the face-to-face -face classroom. So uh, when, when the big COVID transition happened, we were still getting questions um, faculty did, but they, we were still getting questions about how can I deliver my content? That was their main focus. It wasn't necessarily, what are the students learning? <laughs> you know? um, so I think something like WordPress, where the student is actually demonstrating what they're learning, or, you know, you have a record of it, um, you can see, particularly when they're reflecting on what they're learning, you know, what, you know, how that's changing the way they're thinking. I really think that's a slow ship to turn. Um, it, it's just the way faculty have been, were taught themselves and that's what they're comfortable with, like you said. But I, I think it's happening. Um, there are definitely proponents on our campus that are all about uh, students doing more work and, and seeing what they're producing instead of throwing the content at them. And so uh, it's just a slow transition, I think. Yeah, I would echo everything um, you all said. Yeah, I'm also at a small institution, really residential face-to-face -face is, is emphasized and making that transition. Uh, yeah, it makes sense to, I'm going to, to, to lecture uh, going forth. And so I don't think it so much a, a face-to-face to online, so much as a, as a synchronous versus asynchronous idea. Like most people were not familiar with the idea of what it would mean to work with students asynchronously because traditionally if you're face to face like that is just not something you do because you benefit from that face to face uh, time uh, as well. So, I, you know, I think this revealed for a lot of faculty. I'm, I'm hoping that they recognize the ways in which they've been teaching, like coming into that conflict, realizing like, oh, if I try to do what I do and push it into this online you know, mode, thinking it'll be the same. Uh, like it reveals the ways I, I, I teach um, and maybe I need to rethink that, like maybe give students more time to reflect. Can asynchronous be just as good as asynchronous? I mean, I would say yes, you know, and Laura Gibbs would definitely say yes, right? Um, but I think people are just not, especially in a residential mode, not in that, like, no, what I do is I'm, you know, I, I talk to students and like they can only imagine that happens in this kind of you know, conversation. Not that it can't happen like that in an asynchronous world, but it's all of this or or not. 
But it's interesting, and I, I, I want to thank you all for engaging this because I am talking now as like, you know, I used to play a professor on TV as an adjunct. I used to play an instructional technologist at UMW on TV. But one of the things that struck me is as folks started to go on to a Zoom, and I saw this with Antonella, who is my special lady friend who was doing adjunct teaching for um, Italian, is there was this sense of talking into this strange void of black boxes and that idea of presence and bandwidth and people not being there or being there. And like, so the idea of presence that Zoom tried to approximate um, was kind of like laden with its own deep issues about is that presence or like Lori said, is there a presence around having people record and share what they're thinking? in a space that maybe isn't one-to-one -one dependent on bandwidth, immediate access at the moment, simultaneously and synchronously. I mean, I'm obviously a little bit biased, but I thought the push to synchronous video virtual learning at all times seemed anathema to what instructional technology was trying to help folks imagine for decades now. Yeah. And one last thing I'd like to throw in here is like, I think a lot of places students were demanding that because that's what they imagined that they also needed, right? It wasn't just faculty pushing for this. I student, Lots of students are like, I want this thing. And like, not really, you know, they wanted what was easy for them too. Like students working in an asynchronous world, most of I mean, like the students that come into Mary Washington are not used to setting themselves up to work in that mode. Like, just the, I rely on the structure of coming to a class and meeting synchronously to understand what I'm supposed to do. And that threw people for a loop too. Students, I think, wanted the same thing that faculty wanted in many ways. And so we're fine with that. We're not gonna push back. <laughs> well, look, I wish we had more time to keep going with this conversation because now I am, I'm fascinated and I speak really as a bit of an outsider, which I'm not used to. So I wanna thank you all, Shannon, Lori, and Colin for spending some time with us and sharing your experience over the last year. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. For us, yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm going to play the famous, now famous outro. Ready? Get ready. <laughs> um, nom nom nom.